looking around, I finally see I think I need a change The rat race I want to flee My world I'll rearrange I'm getting back to the roots Of how it's meant to be Growing gardens, picking fruit Racing livestock, living free Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We are your hosts, Harold Thornbro and Rachel Jameson. <laughs> How are you doing today, Rachel? I'm doing pretty good. Me pretty too. Good. Had a great Christmas and uh, we we record these, you know, we tell everybody all the time. We record these a little early, so Christmas just happened, you know, for us and we're recording for a couple weeks ahead here. But uh, yeah, had a great Christmas. Things are going good, but we had all that cold weather and man, oh, it was snow. rough. How did you bear all that? It, well, actually, we did not have Christmas here. Oh, yeah? Yeah, no, we didn't. Um, my husband's family is sick, and then we have been snowed in. The blizzard of 2022. Wow. So we have delayed Christmas until we're not sure yet. Spring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. think probably until my husband's family is not sick anymore. So maybe next weekend. We'll see. Yeah. We didn't get that much snow here, but we got the cold. I mean, it. I was. Uh, I had to go to work on Christmas Eve. For, well, actually, uh, Friday, the day before Christmas Eve, and worked 12 hours outside. And it was, I think the, the temperature at that point was a minus nine. with a, It was minus 39 wind chill. 50 mile an hour winds gusts and oh. it was just brutal out there it was a rough day <laughs> you guys got way more cold like we're five hours i think north of you so five so, hours north we're at the 44th parallel mm -hmm. and um we did not get that cold but lake michigan if it's not frozen really insulates us i think yeah. our coldest we got was uh i think it was like 12 degrees with the wind chill at like negative eight or something like that yeah so we didn't get nearly the cold and we did not we got some pretty good gusts but i think you guys even got more wind down there we probably got 30 mile an hour gusts but we got snow yeah Boy, you had to do all that shoveling i didn't even get the shovel out <laughs> so it worked yeah. out good for there but man um i'm just gonna go ahead and tell people now uh whenever i tell you about something i'm doing Listen for a while. Don't just say, oh, he's doing that. I think I'll do that. Listen to see if it's successful for a while. Because my uh, greenhouse aquaponics system did not survive this cold weather. Oh, dear. <laughs> Every plant in there is it's dead. Even the ones in the pots are dead. Everything. I had a heater in there. And but they could not even come close. Oh, I bet I it bet. froze up solid. All the plants are dead. The the, the I mean, oh, it, it just it. Uh, yeah, it's it's now to my defense, this isn't very uncommon even for Indiana to be this cold. I think it were it was record colds for this time of the year. Oh, I mean, it was just it was crazy. Lots of places hit. Records. Uh, we haven't had a winter this cold for years, so had it been what we normally had been getting, it would have been fine. Uh, like I said, it got down. Uh, around zero a few weeks ago and it did not freeze but it couldn't survive this it was just too long and too low of temperatures for too long and it just it killed it so all my lettuce is gone all my i was bragging last week about my uh um cress gone um the only thing that it didn't hurt didn't seem to hurt was the uh the i put those um i had a lot of cuttings in there that okay. i was rooting they seemed to be all right it didn't seem to hurt those at all uh, they just go dormant. I mean, it's just like that they were planted outside, you know, and they just went dormant or something. But yeah, they didn't. They didn't seem to hurt them. Actually, they're still green. As a matter of fact, it didn't even drop the leaves off of them or anything. Um, for some reason, they survived just fine. But yeah, I guess I'm back to just eating the microgreens in the house. I was just gonna say, did you move your microgreens out? <laughs> my, or did you yeah, my microgreens are in the kitchen, so they're okay. fine. I, I didn't even yep. try to do them out there. I ended up doing them in the house anyway. So I still got those. So I guess that's my that's my winter uh, greens this year are going to be uh, microgreens, right. which is fine. <laughs> yeah, I don't have anything outside. I'm growing my lettuce and my. Um, I am actually tried some radish. How's it doing? It's forming radish ball 
Yeah. Little bulbs. Yeah. So cool. we'll see. Maybe I'm better at growing them inside than I am outside because they're never. Yeah, maybe just something about your outside. climate. We, yeah, they're great. Know. Yeah, they grow great here. So I don't know. But um, uh, I have lettuce in the microgreens, but mine are all inside. But man, we shoveled. I mean, people ask what we did this weekend. We shot, we moved snow and then we moved snow and then we moved snow and then yeah. we moved snow. The That's biggest struggle, it, the greenhouse, like I said, I didn't even try to struggle with it when I seen, I, I was working couple of those days it was really cold i couldn't have possibly kept the wood stove going in there i mean the wood stove would have kept it warm enough if i would have been able to sit there and just keep it stoked and just keep it going the whole time i think it would have been plenty warm in there i just couldn't do it uh, so i had the electric heater in there for when i was gone and you know i was, I was gone for 12 hours the bigger struggle I, the thing i was more worried about was the animals because right. the water freezing you know so they did go a few hours with sort of water frozen and i just had to you know keep up when i was here best i could i mean i didn't even sleep i just got up a couple times in the middle of the night and swapped their water out um to keep them uh keep them some fresh water so yeah because it was cold it was freezing so fast that it was oh, just uh, yeah. it was like but as soon as you put it in there they just hit it they'd attack it <laughs> they was you know they knew let's get it before it freezes so uh yeah i had to do that and uh yeah but we did have christmas here and um i got I got some great homestead Christmas gifts. My Why kids, did you get? my kids know me too well. They just know me too well. I got me a, I got me a nice. Uh, I got some books. Got some books I really wanted too because I these are all books that I have checked out at the library for. So I knew I wanted them. Right. Uh, but they're two of them are really expensive. They're Dave Jackie's books on uh, edible forest gardens, and it's a two book oh, set. And it's like a, yeah, they are expensive yeah. books, and I got those for Christmas, which I was really happy about. And I got uh, a couple other permaculture books, but then I got a one point three uh, gallon fermenting crock. I was like, yeah, Ooh. I love that. That was Fancy. great. Got that. I got me some. I got one of them. Um, it's a it's an herb drying basket. I don't know if you've seen those. You hang them up, and they got like I don't know. It's got like six or seven layers in it I've and you unzip one. them and you throw yeah, the herbs yeah. in there and you zip them up and they're you know like, so the bugs can't get on them and stuff or whatever and you just hang them i'm gonna hang that under a gazebo and just fill that thing full of herbs and things and just air dry them yeah uh, i like that idea I mean, yeah. i'm all about using as little power as I yeah have. yeah because i do a lot of dehydrating we do a lot of dehydrating yeah, i so thought that'd I. be a really great way to dry my herbs i do a lot of comfrey too a lot and that'd be really good for drying comfrey yeah, um so uh yeah i got one of those I got a uh, one of them Fisker's um, expandable uh, baskets for like doing foraging and weeding and things. You fill up, it just like pops up, and it, it's oh, it's okay. it's real nice. It's just a real lightweight basket. Like I say, you can collapse it down flat, and you can throw all your weeds and stuff in there, and you can use it for foraging for your animals, or you can just use it for weeding and then take carry That's it cool. to the. Yeah, it's better than just wheeling a wheelbarrow around all the time, and it'll hold more than a wheelbarrow. It's actually a lot bigger. Uh, really? That yeah, because it holds a lot. It's probably three and a half feet tall and. I can't put maybe barely put my arm. I don't think I can put my arms all the way around it. So it's pretty big, but it's really That's lightweight. Cool. So you could fill that with weeds and stuff and, you know, drag that around. Um, so yeah, things like that. I got some pretty cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, we don't really do many gifts. Right yeah. You guys now. don't we do just gifts. Buy for the grandkids. That was all my kids getting me stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I did, you know, I did by myself, which my husband and I kind of have got this working arrangement that, if you want it around Christmas time, just buy it. So call it Christmas. Uh, Black yeah. Friday, there was a there was a deal, and I got myself a Carhartt jacket. That's usually what my wife, me and my wife do too. We usually just we'll yep. buy ourselves something we're wanting around that time, and we'll call that our Christmas gift. We kind of do the same thing for our anniversary. Actually, we'll we'll just kind of buy something yeah. we want, and then we'll call that our anniversary. If we're getting we're something around that time, kind of do stuff like that sometimes. Yeah, but, yeah, we yeah. don't we don't like a big big deal out of it. But for my kids, they always want to try to get stuff for us. We we get way better Christmases we now than we ever did because you know our kids are adults and they have jobs and they have money and it's like they just get us stuff. So it's right. cool. <laughs> but, I got yeah. my Carhartt jacket, which I wore several times this weekend. Um, great yeah they're great they're great to have of course there's that I whole controversy with carhartt we won't get into but I you know, know i don't i don't care i, I own plenty of carhartt things yeah my favorite myself. part of it is it's really long so it covers your bum which mm -hmm. keeps it warm <laughs> so i tell you what now i've got carhartt bibs but you see what I'm wearing. I'm out here in my barn, in my office out here in the barn. It's a little cool out here, but I like these snow bibs. These they're like a plastic, but they're snow bibs, you know. They're they're not yeah. canvas like Carhartts. These are actually warmer than my Carhartts. Are they really? And they're more water resistant than my Carhartts um, also. I have the insulated Bernie. Yeah, yeah. Ones. Now yeah. I could not find a jacket to match it, which is what I wanted to find. 
was a jacket to match it, but they didn't have, they were sold out. So that's why I feel like, with the Carhartt. I feel like the Carhartts are really, they're plenty warm, but if it's snowing really hard or if there's just a lot of moisture and they get wet, um, these are just resistant to water. So like yeah, I these are better pair. if it's snowing, I think. Yeah. I yeah. have an old pair of Columbia bibs yeah. that I'll wear if I'm going to be like in the snow, snow. For us, yeah. it's important. We got to have the clothing. We got to stay warm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm outside a lot. I mean, we're outside a lot in the cold. So being yeah. warm, I mean, having that winter gear is pretty, pretty important. I now you, got, you have your 20 acre property up there. Have you guys been up there since the uh, really cold and the snows hit and all that kind of stuff? Did you have we've it last winter? Out, we've been, yeah, we did. We okay, you had it last the, winter. We do go out there in the winter because um, Scout, which is our mm -hmm. Bernie's Aussie. Needs to burn some energy. So, <laughs> 20 acres and is it's enough. it's just pretty out there. It's so yeah. pretty out there. And you see different things out there in the way. Yeah. It looks, yeah. it is amazing how different it looks. So we're trying to plan where the house site is and where we might have a pole barn and stuff. Mm -hmm. And in the summer, this property is pretty overgrown. We have a lot of, um, we have a lot of bracken, which is yeah. like ferns and stuff like that. We have a lot of um, wild blackberries. Mm-hmm. And so in the summer, it's hard to see, but when, yeah, you can winter, actually when get all those the, leaves fall yeah. off, we're like, I didn't realize there was yep. literally, well, last time we were out there, which was two weeks ago, we were out there and we were both standing in a spot and we said, we didn't think we could put anything there because we didn't realize it was flat there because we couldn't see it. But yeah, without so the tree leaves on, we're yeah. like, oh, it is flat over there. <laughs> It's amazing in the winter how different a property looks than in the summertime. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I've noticed that too. I go hunting in a, the woods I go to. We go, I go to out here. This, uh, it's a, uh, some state property and it's a pretty big area. I mean, it's, you know, uh, right. several hundred acres. I mean, I think a couple thousand acres actually. Um, I can't remember what the acreage is on it now, but in the summertime, I mean, it's all you can do to get through there. It's so thick and there's just some trails here and there. But in the wintertime, you can literally go anywhere and right. it's pretty opened yeah. up and it just looks so different out there, you know, to go out there well, and hunt and right in the now, winter. So, I mean, we're going to talk about this in this podcast, but right now, so some of the things that I can harvest out there right now, because I have started, I started doing a lot of wild foraging in the last few years. One of the things that you can forage here in the north at this time is um, juniper berries, which you can use juniper berry. People use juniper berries and ferments and really you harvest those this time of the year. Yeah. Wow. Yep. See, I don't know nothing about those. We don't have those. And then rose hips. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wild rose hips. Um, yeah. That's kind of about it for right now for me. I'm sure there's other things if I was, I mean, I'm not, I'm not mm -hmm. as skilled. I have friends that forage professionally and they're really skilled at it, but I'm not as forage. It does help me though. Like identify, well, here's the other thing, chaga, which is the tree mm -hmm. mushroom. It's a lot easier to see now than it is in the summer. Have I you found some out there? Yes. We have a couple wow. of birch trees yeah. with some chaga. Um, it also helps us identify. This is about the time of year where we were or any time before leaves are on, um, how we're going to get in and out with maple syrup buckets and. Okay. Yeah. That. It's probably a good time to, to make trails too. Cause if you started stomping down through some trail areas now and kept it going yeah. into the spring before stuff starts growing back, it would kind of open up some, some ways right. to get into yeah. parts of the property that you didn't access before. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. We, I do some wild har harvesting and, um, there's some things. Plus, it's just nice to go out and get some fresh air. And yeah, yeah, for sure. I just didn't know if this. I thought maybe this was the first year you'd had it in the winter time. I no, didn't know when you got the it. Second year. Okay, great. But yeah. last year we had so many brush piles because it was logged and they left all the tops and you could uh -huh. hardly walk. You couldn't even walk through there. You were tripping. There was no way. And then once the snow was down, it was really hard to tell. Yeah. But this year we spent all summer clearing logs and um, this year you can actually walk without tripping yeah, so. yeah well what we're going to talk about today is uh some things you can start doing to begin homesteading even if you don't have land and we're, we kind of na narrowed it down to 12 things i think there could have been a hundred things because yeah. i honestly think there are so many things you can do even if you live in an apartment to begin homesteading and i feel like this is kind of a back to basics episode for sure i mean but you know it's a it's a new year it's uh you know, kind of fresh beginning. There's a lot of people who are maybe just for the first time thinking, boy, I'd like to start homesteading or I'd like to start learning some things to be more self-sufficient. Right. And these are all things you can do no matter where you live. But 
for so many years, I, I heard so many people just say, one of these days, I want to start homesteading. And my, what I always said, trust me, you can do it right where you're at. Yes. You live in town, you can do it. You live in an apartment, there are things you can do. There are some things you can do to begin homesteading. And we're just going to talk about 12 things. Now, why we pick 12 things? There's 12 months. <laughs> you can literally uh, learn one of these things a, mo yep. a month and, you know, just pick one at a time because you can't overwhelm your yourself if you take on too many things all at once. So I say take one a month and, and really focus on that skill and and learn it. And, and you know, just you're not going to master it, of course, but then you're going to be doing that plus the next thing next month. And then that plus the next thing the next month. And some of these things are more for a certain time of the year. Like we're going to talk about hunting, for example. You don't want to do that in the summer. You're probably going to do that in the in the fall and the winter. Um, so, I mean, there's just things you can do at different times that are more ideal for those times of the year. But, yeah, here's just 12 things just off the top of our heads that things you could do anytime. Like I said, we it could have been a, an endless list, I think. I mean, we, we were talking about all the things that aren't on this list, and there's plenty. But uh, right. I think these are good things. I think these are things that can absolutely help you. For sure. I think that um... – you know, one of the things that you have on here is cooking from scratch. Yeah, um, such an underrated skill. I think it's, it is. I'm, I really, I, I'm careful to say this, but I think it might be the most important homesteading skill. I really think it might be. Well, yeah, you have to be able to use what you grow. Yeah. What good is all those other things if you can't cook it, if you can't make anything from it and use it? Yeah, yeah. Right. I just think it's the and, most, and again, I think it's, it's the one of those best things, one. I mean, you can have an apartment. You could be living in a camper and learn this skill, you know? Yeah. There's a few reasons I think it's such an important skill to learn. For one, you're going to eat so much healthier if you oh, yeah. cook from scratch. I mean, you're not putting all the things in there to preserve it, you know? I mean, everything that you buy in a box, a can, a bag, it's loaded with a bunch of stuff that don't need to be in there if you're cooking it fresh. Yeah, but I mean, they do then, that to preserve it, you know? Yeah. I mean, just start reading your labels. I yeah. Mean, if you read your labels, you will see when you buy a box, there's probably, I don't know, probably at a minimum 70% of what is on the back yeah. of that box. You can't even pronounce it. And you could make that without any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, it's just going to be way healthier for you. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. If you cook from scratch, you're going to you're going to feel better. It, it, it's just going to serve your body better. It really is. Um, I think it tastes better too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, and you know, it tastes better. It's cheaper. I mean, an example yeah. right now, I, I made yogurt yesterday mm -hmm. and, um, to buy yogurt, I think I cannot remember the price is everything. I can't even keep up with the price of what, what it costs, but to buy yogurt, I think a quart of it or whatever that, I think that's a quart that you get. If you get it in the big, pint, I think, plain. pint, I think is what comes Maybe in. it's a pint. I yeah. think it might be bigger. We buy the bigger, oh, I buy plain whole fat yogurt. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't buy, I, we don't use the um, sugar or anything like that. But when I bought it, I would buy that. Well, when I started making it, I can literally make it. I think it's like a quarter of the price. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. You'll save all kinds of money. So easy. Yeah. It's and so easy. probably tastes better too. Even, even that probably tastes better. Yeah. I mean, and then uh, sometimes it's a different taste. Fruit. Yeah, yeah, it is a little bit different. And I mean, then you have to you add your own fruit and you right. can add your sugar, whether it's you want to add dates or you want to add stevia or but you you don't have to add aspartame or sucrose. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of that stuff that's really not very good for you. Right. Um, you can use that as you can use that as a sour cream substitute. You know, mm -hmm. it's just the possibilities are endless and it does save you money. You know, sometimes cooking from scratch doesn't necessarily save you money, but it's healthier. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and honestly, there are so many people who do not know how to cook from scratch now. I mean, they just don't have a clue where to start at cooking their meal yeah. from scratch. And I think you're, if you can learn that skill, you're, re, you're reviving a lost and dying skill. I mean, yeah, it really is. I mean, there's there's so many places on YouTube to learn it. There's so many varieties of how to cook that, you know, we can't get into that here because, you know, even me, I'm gluten free and yeah. one of my kids is egg free and one of my grandkids is dairy. -free you can make the decision just, on what goes in there. Yeah. And you know, for a so fact, many, it's not in there. Yeah. We have that blessing of YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah. you can just go and go how to make, I don't know, maybe you need to make coconut milk yogurt. Yeah. 
how to make coconut milk yogurt, you know, how to make yogurt. It's, um, there's just, we have that blessing there and yeah, I had to learn, sure. I had, it's a skill I had to learn, you know, and I'm happy to help anybody if they wanted to text yeah. or comment on this podcast when it's done, but there's so much YouTube out there right now and some wonderful homesteaders out there putting out really good content. Yep. And like I said, I, I think it's one of the most important thing. I, I love it also just because I can pick where my meat comes from or my vegetables yep. come from. You can make ethical choices when you're when you cook from yeah. scratch because when you're buying 100%. stuff in the store, how them animals were raised, how them chickens were being raised to give you the eggs, how anything, even the dairy that's in products, you can choose. You could go to local farms and buy the stuff and you know how your animals are being treated and then you can get that that those ingredients to make your your meals and you can make ethical choices uh, where you don't really have that choice when you're buying everything from the store already processed and done up. Um, and there's a really good chance it's pretty unethical in the way that most of that stuff is, is treated. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. So um, yeah. And, and you know what, there's going to be a lot less waste when you cook from scratch too, because not everything's coming yeah. in plastic bags and, you know, cans that are just getting thrown in the trash or whatever. All that stuff is going in a trash can. And I can tell yeah. you most trash that's being produced, well, other than food waste, right. the, probably the second most thing is from from the actual packaging of food. Um, there's right. just, you look in your kitchen trash can, what's in there? It's probably packages of that your food came in. Yeah. You're not going to yeah, have I mean, a lot of that when you're cooking from scratch. Yeah, you don't. And once you, I mean, depending on the size of your family, um. Once you start cooking from scratch, you can buy some of your ingredients in bulk, which will save you money, but it also saves on packaging. And and the thing is, you don't have to grow your own vegetables to do this. You don't have no. to raise your own animals to do this. You can go to the farmer's market or you can support local farms. You yeah. can just or just buy whole ingredients from the store even. Yeah, you can get you know? CSA and vegetables yep. up here. I don't we live kind of in a where it's really cool to have CSAs and farming stuff. So we have CSAs for milk, CSAs for eggs, CSAs for bread, mm -hmm. yeah. CSAs That's for... That's community-supported agriculture. Yeah. Folks don't yeah. know what that is. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. And then we have that. We have it for meat, too. And so a community-supported agriculture is where you support the farmer, so you pay kind of for a membership, and then you get, like, this weekly or monthly pickup. And mm -hmm. um, so you can... it's. Usually, maybe a little bit cheaper to do that, probably than go to the farmers market. But some places don't have it. Some places right. have both. Some places have. There's a few farms where they work together, and you go to one pickup to pick up several yeah. different CSAs. So, um, you know, and and like you said, you can even if you go to the store and you cannot afford, like I get, you know, regenerative meat. If you cannot afford that, even just removing those preservatives from your yeah. diet. Is just buying the improvement. yeah, just buying the, the the ingredients as a whole, you know, ingredient. Yeah. Uh, buy a you know a, a a pork loin, you know, or whatever to make your. I mean, you can just do things that will make it you know yeah. better than right. that. Though it, it is it perfect. It would be better if you could raise your own, obviously, or grow your own, obviously. But right. there's a middle ground there, and it's still better than what you'll get in those packages for sure. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. so much. I think I think people's health would improve overall, even if they just removed. Um, all of those, whatever those ingredients are that you cannot pronounce, if you just removed a mm -hmm. lot of that and just went back to, you know, the the pork loin, some broccoli out of the freezer, you know. And <clears throat> yeah. And you know yeah. what? You're living in an apartment right now and you're thinking, oh, I wish I could be homesteading. You can do this. You can do this wherever yeah. you're at. I mean, this is, you don't have to have any land to do this. And it's, like I said, probably the number one most important homesteading skill. <laughs> and you can do it. So yeah, learn to cook from scratch. Shows are, uh, yeah. Huge on YouTube and stuff like that. Yeah. I think cooking is great, but it kind of takes us to the next one. Maybe you are making a lot of stuff from scratch and uh, you've got your hands on some veggies or some meat that you want to can. You can learn canning and there's mm -hmm. a couple different methods for canning and you can do them both wherever you're at. You can purchase yeah. the equipment. Um, I think water bath canning is a good place to start. I mean, it's where I started. You can do simple things like making jellies and jams and making some pickles or some salsa or something like that and use your water bath canning. And it's really safe and it's really easy. And um, I feel like it's actually I've gotten to where I think it's a little more work now, now that I've 
you know, sometimes I pressure can things that I could probably water bath can just because it's a, to me, it's a little easier uh, once uh, just because you have to drag out more stuff to do the water bath canning. You know, I feel like, I mean, you have to get your, right. Uh, yeah. Just the racks and the, I mean, just, there's just more stuff involved, but well, you can get you have the fancy electric. Canner, I, I do is, have an electric yeah. pressure canner, which is even easier. That's why I'll do that sometimes rather than water bath can you, I can actually water bath can in that as well, though. It's actually got oh, set up. Okay. You can do both in it. Um, yeah, you can water well, bath can in that. With something like that, I mean, if you're in an apartment and you don't mm-hmm. have a lot of space, that little thing, yeah, it's yeah. small. And if there's only one of you or two of you, it's kind of perfect. Yeah, they didn't. They weren't. You couldn't find them for a while. I there was a friend of mine yeah. who was wanting one, and I was trying to find him. I was like, yeah, nobody's selling them. They're out of stock everywhere. And then they came back in stock here recently. I need yeah. to put a link to that in the show notes. I'll put a link it's to that. Should. It's the yeah. uh, carry. Uh, pressure canner. I think there's another company. Maybe Presto's making one now or something. Um, I'm not sure. For a while, Carrie was the only one that. The yeah, I think there is another one now, and it's even supposed to be better now. I think there's another one's even better. I heard somebody mention on another podcast. But those are like perfect for small. Like you, you're living in an apartment, or there's just one or yeah. two of you. I mean, I have my huge canners that I use, but me too. And that's just that one's um, more convenient for sure. Yeah, for sure. But my equipment takes up so much room, and if you're at a limited space, this would just be a perfect. And spot. and you know what? It there is a learning process with canning. There's some things to learn there, so start learning it. I mean, and it's something that will serve you well for the rest of your life if you learn how to can. You will be able yeah. to put things up. I mean, we just put a lot of leftovers up. Like we'll make a big thing of chili, you know, and we don't eat it all. You know what? I'll throw a couple, two or three or four jars of what's left over in the yeah. pressure canner, can it up, stick it in the cabinet. And then yeah, I mean, one, one day that... we'll just pull it out and dump it in a pot, warm it up and have chilly. Yeah. You know, go ahead one of the things that I do a lot is broth. I mean, that's like mm-hmm. I haven't bought broth from the store in years. And believe it or not, speaking of being thrifty, I get a lot of my bones given to me mm-hmm. to make broth. So yeah. that's just free food right there. Yeah, so learn learn canning. I think it's one that every uh, aspiring homesteader should pick up and start doing. And again, no land necessary. You can pick the same stuff up you're cooking from scratch. You can pick that same stuff up and can it for later date. Yeah, you know, I don't want to cook right now with that. Go ahead and buy it when it's in season and when it's cheaper and can it. Put it up and then you can make something out of it later. And you'll have those ingredients for when you need to use them. And, and in that same vein, fermenting is a great thing to start learning. Yeah. Um, you can start with something really simple like sauerkraut. I yep. I used to be intimidated by fermenting a little bit and I made sauerkraut one time and I was like, well, that was the easiest thing ever. You know, yeah, I mean, you, you it's need salt, salt cabbage and, and cabbage. Container. Yeah. I, I was making at the time I was following one of these old videos on doing it in Mason jars Yep, and just made it in a Mason jar. And I was like, set it up for a few days and I had sauerkraut and I was like, well, that was like the most simple thing I've ever made on my homestead ever. And it's just so easy. I'm telling you. And then I got into making kombucha for a drink. It's a yeah. fermented tea and it's super easy. I mean, some people have a little more trouble with it, but I, I don't find it hard to make it all. So, I mean, there's just, there's some simple things out there that you can ferment. It can get more complicated. There are some things that the fermenting gets a little bit more complicated on how you do things. But there are some things that are just super, super easy. Right. And there's like, there's groups on Facebook on Mm -hmm. it, but there's, um, I do a lot of wild fermenting. So I don't use a lot of like a lot of this stuff, which they are handy. It does make it more foolproof to use airlocks and some of the Mm -hmm. handy tools that they have. But I've kind of stuck to the old school method Mm -hmm. and I don't use those things. Um, And you can, there's, books out there that you can get from the library on wild fermenting. There's several, several groups on Facebook. There's YouTube places. Um, Oh yeah, for sure. And there's courses. There's people out here that have websites dedicated to it and they have courses on it. If you want to take a course, if you're a person that really wants that more one-on-one kind of in a course kind of thing where you're learning more directly from somebody, there's stuff like that out there as well. Yeah. And I mean, stuff like your kombucha, you're going to need your SCOBY, which is the Mm -hmm. The mushroom, basically, or the symbiotic organism that yeah, sits on the, the top. Yeah, SCOBY is, uh, is, is stands for the, something, but I can't, yeah. Symbiotic or organism. No, center, I don't know. There's a, yeah. it's, a, it's actually an acronym. <laughs> it is, not it a is. Word. So you can, but you can make one, which is how I got mine. But you can also find them 
locally. Like there's mm-hmm. these groups that you can hook up with or and somebody can, will say, I'll give you some of mine. Or you can <laughs> you know? literally buy one on Amazon or something. They sell yeah, them and they're yeah. out there. I mean, it's just, it's yeah, really simple you to get your hands do, on one. Those are probably two of the easiest things to start with though, are like our sauerkraut, kombucha, um, kefir or kefir, however you want to say it, mm-hmm. mil- milk grains. And you can buy those on Amazon too. Maybe some kimchi or something like that. Yeah, 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 whatever you like. And you can buy those ingredients at the store. You can buy them at the farmer's market. You know, you can And like I said, some whatever. simple tools. They make some simple things for mason ma- yep. a jar. Uh, like what I got for Christmas here, I got that, I got that fermenting oh, crock, which is great. Cool. I've always done things in mason jars and, you know, and just jars and things, bigger jars and stuff. But yeah, I'm going to love having that crock. That's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh, I would but have yeah. to say the, uh, the mason jar, ball jar is like the uh, home, <laughs> the most versatile homestead <laughs> tool ever. In it the- is. Yeah. And they make all these little things for them with the lids, special yep. lids and weights and just all this stuff for them to Between make them more, the even more versatile. Bucket, yeah. Yeah. Those go. two <laughs> things right there are just a, the homesteader's tool of choice for sure. Yes. For sure. Yep. So, yeah, but those are just, again, in the kitchen. These are things you can do in an apartment. So easy. Yep. I mean, you don't need any land to do these things. Now, the next one, you might, it may serve you well to have a right. little yeah. bit of land or a balcony or something. But, you know, you don't even have to have it for that. We were just talking about it in the beginning of the show about growing things in pots or microgreens, having some container gardens or microgreen gardens in your house. You can do that in a windowsill or under some grow lights or on a balcony or a front porch with a little bit of sunlight or whatever. I mean, you can do it completely indoors, though. You can do it in an apartment. You don't have to have it. And I'm telling you, putting some seeds in a pot, setting them in a windowsill is the easiest thing in the world. Grow some lettuce under a grow light even is simple. To do microgreens, um, I'll link up a blog post that I wrote on growing microgreens in your kitchen on a shelf. It's simple. Yeah, and I use You did this years ago, and I bought the trays when you mm-hmm. wrote this article. I actually bought those trays. I still use those same trays to grow my microgreens. Yeah. Super yep. easy. I mean, it's just a, it's the simplest thing in the world to grow some microgreens, you know, and you will actually have fresh veggies, you know, that you're growing in an apartment if you, if that's They're where you're so at. Uh, and it's just not hard. And again, if you've never grown anything before, you know, it's a good intro into growing things, you know, what mm-hmm. it takes for watering and how much light it needs. And and if you if you fail a couple of times, just try again. It, it's you know, I won't say people say, oh, I have a you have a green thumb, right? Don't have a green thumb. I don't believe that. I think it just takes a little bit of practice and you'll get better at it. You know, you just need to pay attention and, and just learn, you know, everything's a learning process and growing things grow. I mean, they're made to grow and you just have to supply a few things, you know, you have to have the proper temperatures, you have to have the water and you have to have some sunlight. Things will grow, you know, and. And you can even do sprouts, which don't even need, they don't grow long enough to need water. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I mean, microgreens don't require water. a lot more than that. I mean, they don't even need yeah, a lot they don't, of light or anything. Bit. I mean, yeah. yeah, they don't need, you don't need to have a lot of sunlight, direct sunlight or anything like that. I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of soil there involved, but it, it's, I mean, just a few days of growing and then you're harvesting and eating and it's, it's fantastic really. And it tastes great and it's just super, super help, uh, healthy for you. So again, don't need land for this. I mean, uh, it's it's something you can do right now, and you're you'll be getting started homesteading. The next one, a little more controversial on whether you need some land or not, is composting. Right. There are setups out there for trash can composting. Have you seen I those can't before? Wait to see this? No, there, I yeah, there, there, you, you Google it, you'll find them. I did put a link in for one. Uh, the spruce uh, has one that they're real simple. And literally, I think I first heard about this from Jack Spearco. Okay. I was a member in his group. I am still a member of his his uh, member support brigade, you know, the survival podcast, if you don't know who, what that is. But anyway, he has videos in there on how to make trash can composters, uh, compost. And he has like two, two or three, I think. And he does a rotation between those three. And the third one, by the time the third one's done, you got this finished compost in a trash can. Interesting. And it's just a, it's super simple and it's easy and you'll find all kinds of how to's all over online. I put one in there, but you can do it with a couple trash cans and compost in trash cans, but something everybody can do indoors is even vermicomposting. We've talked about that plenty on this podcast, but setting up a couple, you know, totes or whatever, making you some, or, or getting a store-bought vermicompost uh, setup. 
and you could vermicompost, which is with worms. Right. I was just um, gonna say, and that's with worms. Yeah, that's with yep. worms. So you may, if you have a garage or, or a little bit of you know grass out back to set a couple trash cans, you could do some outdoor composting or do it indoors with some vermicomposting. So you can compost. Now, can you do large scale composting? No, you can't. You're probably not going to be, if you live in an apartment, you're not going to be able to throw a compost bin up, you know, in your right. garage or something even. Right. You just can't do that. But, um, you know, you can absolutely do it on a small scale. And I would say do it. Even if you think that you're not going to get a ton of benefit from it, you're going to learn a lot of things about composting to 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 do it. So do it. And then you can even use a little bit of that compost in your container gardening. <laughs> so it'll benefit you. Uh, or you can give it away if you ain't got no place to use it because you're going to be learning how to compost and you're going to be making good use of your scraps and things. And it'll be good practice and you'll learn some things and you will be able to use a little bit of it. Um, so yeah, do some composting. It's not, it's not hard, but it's something you should learn as a homesteader. I think it's important. The next ones are things you're not going to do on your land. But I don't do them on my land. I have a quarter acre. You know, you don't, you actually do have a, a lake. Well, we do now, but for <laughs> Attached you, to your yeah, uh, property, yeah. so you could do it. It's yeah. fishing. I think fishing is a great way to provide for your homestead. But you don't have to own any land to go fishing. I mean, you go to places. You go to a lake, a local yeah. lake or whatever. You find a local river. You you can learn things like lure fishing, bait fishing, fly fishing. You know, you can learn all the techniques and catching fish with these different methods. Then you can learn how to clean fish yeah, and cook fish. And, you know, I did a podcast with uh, a man named uh, Cannon Kirby here uh, a couple months ago, um, and oh, we yeah. did a whole podcast episode on fishing. You know, go back and listen to that podcast episode, um, because I think it's a great way to provide a lot for your homestead. And it's not something you necessarily have to be doing on your property. Right. And it, yeah. you can fill your freezer with fish. I mean, absolutely. Provide fish a lot of, of food. Yeah, it's great. I love it. So, yummy. so I love it. yeah. So and that's put, like speaking. Going back to the next one, I mean, composting that what's left of that fish. That's like, man, that stuff's golden. Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to throw fish scraps in my vermicompost bin, or maybe even you really? definitely want to have a place to put an outdoor compost bin a little yes. bit. Of it, oh yeah, it, yeah. It will have some temporary smell for probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one might. But for us, it's perfect. I got a compost bin clear at the back of my property, and it's perfect for that. And it is a it makes a great compost. You're right, it does. It does. And it's actually great made... just to dig a hole and put it like at the base of plants or something. I'd yeah. put it like around my rose bushes. I like I like to make a little shovel slice at the base of my rose bushes and just drop fish scraps down there. Uh, feeds them really good. It's a great fertilizer. That was one of the best gardens we ever had was yep. when we used fish um, scraps for our mm -hmm. corn patch. Oh, yeah. my word. There's a lot to learn there. Corn. I mean, there's people who make whole businesses out of it and careers out yeah. of, you know, this. So, I mean, it's a, it's a great thing to learn. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a great skill to have. And it is a little bit of a skill. You're not going to go out there and just, you know, drop a line and catch a fish. I mean, there's some things to learn about baiting hooks and what baits to use and how to right. use a lure property properly. And, you know, if you get into fly fishing, that's a whole thing by itself there. If oh, you're doing yeah. some river fly fishing and thing, that's a whole genre all to itself. But yeah, and it's fun. You know, it's something you can do with your kids or your grandkids or your spouse or whatever. And it's just a and great time. Around. Yeah, year round. Year There's round. all kinds. Fishing is yeah. year round. I mean, we're like hunting and stuff isn't, but um, yeah, right. fishing, you can, like right now, We've just finally gotten cold enough for our lake to freeze so we can mm -hmm. go ice fishing. A lot of you said yeah. hunting is the next thing we we're going to talk about. And you just said hunting's not year round. Hunting isn't year round for every game, but yeah. there is a lot of hunting that is not maybe all year round, but really close. I mean, because yeah. you're talking a lot of small game, you're talking ducks and, you know, waterfowl and things. You're talking, yep. you know, larger game, you know, like deer and elk and things like that, depending on where you live. Um, there's, there's a lot of game you can hunt at different times of the year yeah. for sure. I, I mean, you even get into I, things like frog gigging and things like that. I mean, you yeah, could do things like that's that. It's hunting. I mean, it's it's things you're doing year round, really. You can do those things year round. I think um, small game is pretty overlooked by a lot of people. Oh, it so is. And it's probably what we, it's the most meat I put in my freezer is a small game. Yeah. Absolutely. What, like squirrel? Squirrel mostly, but rabbit yeah. too. I mean, even though I raise rabbits, right. I will shoot some rabbits too. And then, you know, uh, we will do a little bit of like coon hunting and things like that. I mean, you know, but mostly it's squirrel. I eat a lot of squirrel. <laughs> we yeah. eat a lot of squirrel. I'll put, I don't know how many pounds. I probably put more. Well, this year I'm definitely putting more squirrel meat than deer meat in my freezer. Cause I haven't been getting out there and deer hunting. I need to, I'm running out of time because now late archery's 
I think it's in now and I probably only have a right. couple more weeks I could probably go. So I need to get out there. I honestly have only went two times oh, this wow. whole season. I just haven't been out there. I've just been, I've let myself get busy on other things. So I obviously, I did go out squirrel hunting a few times. So I've got some squirrel. I right. have more squirrels than anything in my freezer as far as meat goes. So, but yeah, I was, I, absolutely. Small game is something that's overlooked. I think waterfowl is overlooked. I mean, duck, yeah. geese. Uh, I mean, you can put a lot of a lot of meat. You can go pheasant and quail hunting. I mean, there's just there's so many. You, you can put a lot of a lot of uh, meat you in could. the freezer and and yeah. and yeah. can it or whatever. Um, you can provide a lot of meat for yourself with hunting. And I've, I've written a couple posts, uh, done some podcasts in the past, uh, in the past, I've done one on hunting squirrel, hunting deer. Um, I've talked a lot about, uh, where, how to find places to hunt if you don't own the land. And if you live in an apartment on a small piece of land, that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to find places to hunt. There's a lot of state ground, federal land. There's, there's, you know, just getting in touch with people who do own land. And maybe, and I talk a little bit about that in, in a blog post I wrote. So, Check those out if you're interested in hunting. I would also say take up archery because there's opportunities with archery hunting that you won't have with um, hunting with a gun. Uh, either people won't allow it on their land with a gun. They might with archery or the season extension. Like they're like if you're hunting large game like deer, there's a ton more time you can hunt archery than you can with a gun in the season. Yeah. So take in archery, uh, learn archery, and you'll have a lot more opportunity to hunt. So and then there's a whole lot of things to learn with like processing, you know, gutting the animals, processing the animals, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, there's a lot to learn. So you can start learning that right where you're at, no matter where you're at. Absolutely. Yeah, you can. Yeah. I mean, and one of the things you put on here was butchering, which you were just talking about. And um, we've never actually owned. Well, we have chi we've had chickens and my husband owned animals when he was young. But I've learned a lot of butchering just by helping friends and going to mm -hmm. farms and um. You can learn those skills. And, you know, one of those skills you can learn even at home by going to the store. Mm -hmm. It's not quite butchering, but it's very similar is you can buy like a whole chicken and learn to cut it up. You can yep. buy a whole fish with scales on it and learn to mm -hmm. cut it up and process it. I mean, it's going to be gutted, but in some it, places, maybe you can buy it not and, gutted. And you'll get it cheaper. Yeah. Than buying it already, so, per, you know, parted yeah, out for you. You get the bones, yeah. which yeah. both of those make. Great, great meat stock. Mm -hmm. I know that people don't often think of fish stock, but you, it yeah. is, especially Absolutely. in some cooking, yeah. it's, you know, so you can learn a lot just by um, buying whole pieces with bones in, mm -hmm. not necessarily actually going to a farm and actually learning to do it. You can start small. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. You've, uh, this has been your year for that. You've done a lot of, uh, yeah. you've processed pigs and, uh, of course. Yeah, I've processed pigs in the past, but yeah, um, but you did a we've cow. Done, you know, we've done lots of. We've always hunted, so we've we've done several. I don't know, several deer, deer, yeah, yeah, and um, in lots of pheasants and birds. But this was fish. your first experience recently processing a cow, yeah. right? So this was my first ex a couple years ago. I think I did was it a couple years ago. Yeah, probably a couple years ago. I did my first hog, mm -hmm. and then this year we did, and then this year we did two more hogs. And then I've done, I don't even know how many chickens and ducks with people, hundreds <laughs> yeah. and hundreds. But um, this year was this December 4th, I think, is when I went. It was the first time I, we did it. I've ever done a cow. Yeah. That's and a whole, that's I mean. That's a really big animal. It's a big job. But and like we talked about when we talked about that yeah. before in an episode, but that. The knowledge coming from that, I mean, that scales down. So anything's everything smaller than that, pretty much. So anything smaller than that, right. you just take that and just reduce it a little bit. And it, it's the same right. process for any large animal like that. Yeah. And learning how to like part it out and skin mm -hmm. it and use the um use the different parts. Mm -hmm. I mean, fish has liver too. So yeah. you you know, what would you do with the fish liver? Well, fish liver is part of a lot of eastern cooking. Um and just because it's not this huge, like the cow liver is, it scales yeah. down. I mean, even to like chickens and squirrels. I mean, it, it must be super healthy because they make those little pills and, you know, yeah. for the, like the supplements rather for uh, fish right? oil, yeah. <laughs> fish liver well, and oil. Like and <laughs> fermented cod liver oil, which is a yeah. really huge thing with a lot of people that's livers, you know, and, um, uh -huh. you know, a lot of Eastern cooking has fermented 
lots of dip. They have, they do some interesting cooking and they use all of those parts of the animal. Yeah. Yeah. That can scale up or down. And, and however far you want to go with that. I mean, yeah. you, maybe you don't want to go that far with it and that's fine. No, no. You stop where you want, but it just opens up opportunities for all that. If you learn these things. Yeah, right. for sure. Right. And I mean, and maybe you're even a vegetarian or a vegan and a lot of vegetarians and vegans eat tons of mushrooms. Yeah. Well, yeah, the foraging. That foraging. Is, it's going yeah. to foraging. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole other skill you can learn. You, again, you're probably not going to do that. You might do that on a little piece of property. Like if you got a small backyard, I can do a lot of foraging. I mean, we have plantain oh, yeah. and dandelion, and we have a lot of things that grow on my little property that are just your weeds, but you forge those, you make things out of those. They have yeah. a lot Personally. of purposes. You can eat them. I mean, you can make medicinal things out of them, which we can get into in a minute. But yeah, there's a lot of just things that grow, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, right here i mean that are wild but if you can if you have access to a larger piece of land like i said either maybe a park or uh some state land or something like that yeah. there's all kinds of stuff in there you can go in there and forage there's things like you said mushrooms berries mm-hmm. you were talking about going out to your 20 acre property and collecting berries there's all kinds of medicinal plants um oh, yeah. like when i lived in tennessee man ginseng was really big down there like everybody was always foraging for ginseng because they would oh, sell it they would get it and sell it you know and, and and people would make things out of it of course but it was huge down there um yeah but there's just a lot of if you get into that there's a whole thing on foraging different plants for medicinal reasons you know for for yeah, their, their mean, benefits flowers you know, things- and all kinds of stuff one of the things we might want to, you know, warn people about is stuff, especially if you're a beginner and you're doing this mm-hmm. in town, is um, make sure that wherever you're doing this, they're not spraying. Sometimes if you're yeah. doing this like in a town park or something like that, they might be spraying some things. So, yeah, yeah. Make sure it's an yeah. area that's not being treated with anything. Yeah. And, and also as a safety precaution, be 110% sure of what you have and what yes. you can use it for. Because there are dangerous things out there. I mean, you don't want to like throw some hemlock in your mouth or something. You're going to die. Um, yeah. <laughs> there, there's some mushrooms that will make you terribly ill or possibly dead. So, yeah. you know, if you can find people that can teach you this, all the better. But even if you're using books and and videos and things like that, just be just do yeah. your homework on lookalikes and understand the differences and be really clear. There's some things that are there's no danger at all. Like you can go out and you know what a mulberry looks like. If you want to go out and you know forage yeah. for mulberries, right. there's really no danger in that. If you want to you know or, or something like that or find a or walnut a tree and collect the walnuts or a dandelion, right. yeah. But mushrooms, some berries. Some medicinal plants be very, very careful. There, right. there's some things yeah, and, that are dangerous. And I interviewed uh, Aaron and Joe Grenchik and um, Grenchik, I think it is how I pronounce it. And they, <laughs> they're really, they're like yeah. certified mushroomers. It's a great episode. I've, Go listen to that if yeah, you haven't listened to that, folks. That's yeah. a great episode. And I'm actually going. I signed up to take their class, and I believe it's April. Awesome. Yeah. I signed up to take their class because that's they great. show you how to identify the mushrooms properly and. I just, mushrooms scare me. (laughs) Yeah, me too. I mean, there's only a couple kind. I will, I, because I've not taken the time to go out and be with somebody who's really professional at all the different kinds of mushrooms. When I go out mushroom hunting, there's only a couple kind I'm looking for. And and so I don't, I mean, I bypass a lot of fungi that uh, I could probably eat that I ain't about to pick because I don't know nothing about it, you know? Um, So yeah, that. You just know what you're dealing with, but you can get fruit. I mean, I there's apple trees in the wild. There's all kinds of fruit trees out there. Yeah. I mean, you could actually go get, you could forage for fruit. You can forage for nuts. I mean, you can, you yeah. know, find walnut trees and things like that and collect them. Foraging is huge. And, and it can, again, provide a lot for your homestead. It really can. And sure it's can. fun. What ain't fun about walking around in the woods? <laughs> <laughs> it's fun it's exercise it's something yeah, you can do with great. your kids absolutely I mean, it's yeah. just you can take your dog with you it's just i that's one of our favorite activities yeah even if we don't even find anything we're gonna eat um, yeah i mean i just go for hikes just, and if i yeah. find some things i say hey i was foraging <laughs> right and some of these things like you would be able to use topically but you can't ingest you know and just, yeah, which know. brings us to the next thing, and that's herbalism. Um, yeah, herbalism is something you can study and learn and practice wherever you're at, and and foraging will probably pay a can play a part in that, or you can just buy the things. You can right. 
get on Amazon or go to one of these, uh, you know, stores online and buy the ingredients you need to, to make your own things. And, um, there's just all kinds of things you can get into with that. I mean, uh, you can learn about all the different herb qualities. Again, there's courses out there. There's some great courses out there to learn herbalism. And how far do you want to go with it? Do you want it to be just simple and make a few simple things? You want to make some simple oils or some simple tinctures or some right. salves or things like that, some simple herbal things that you can use? Or do you want to go full blast into it? I mean, because you can. You can make a career out of it. You can take it so far. You really yeah. can. I mean, there's a lot of people who do. Sure. And and I'm fascinated by it. I mean, I love it. I, I The more yeah, I learn too. about it, the more I want to learn more about it, you know? Um, so it's, it's a whole thing. You can go down and you can do that wherever you're at. Um, there is a YouTube channel that I really like, uh, and she just does simple things. It's healing harvest homestead YouTube channel. Uh, I think her name is, um, Heidi. I can't think of her last name, but anyway, uh, healing home, healing harvest homestead. And I put a link in the show notes for that. Uh, she, she does a lot of herbal uh, remedy stuff and she'll show you how to make it and how to apply it, you know, how, what it does for you and stuff. It's just really, and she's just really down to earth about it, you know? Um, and I, I like watching her channel. So yeah, there's all kinds of YouTube channels yeah, out there. I there's all kinds of love, courses and books. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love herbs. I'm drinking lemon balm and licorice tea right now. So <laughs> there I you mean, go. I love herbs. Again. Yeah. You can use it for things like that making teas and things too. So mm -hmm. herbalism is something no matter where you're at. And it's a great homestead skill to start with. And you can start with the simplest of things, simple, really delicate herbs. You can take it into really hardcore medicinal purposes. Even you can go as far as you want with it. Um, I mean, I like making things out of comfrey, plantain, and dandelion. I mean, and you can, or, or, those are just simple herbs you're finding in your yard. You can make things out of them, but you can go a lot further with it if you want. So yeah, that's one I would definitely look into. Um, now the next one we debated on, well, you debated on whether it was something you could even do with no land, uh, carpentry. I think you can. I think carpentry is a skill you can learn if you've never done it, but you, you can do simple, small projects. If you, if it's a little bit bigger and you don't have a garage or something you could do it in, you know, you could maybe find a friend's place to do it at, you know, you could learn or go someplace and just go to your parents' house and their garage and, you know, or something like that. I mean, you know, you can go other places to do it and learn some carpentry skills. You could literally go to maker spaces. You can find maker spaces yeah, yeah. in a lot of, a lot of areas uh, and, and build things you know, to take yeah. back and use. And it could be something as simple as a birdhouse or, you know, you could make things that are usable in your apartment. It could just, and I think these are just skills that are valuable to acquire now because if you do end up with a piece of land, right. I I find I build a lot of things <laughs> and I'm repairing a lot of things. And my carpentry skills are very beneficial to have when you have a homestead, you know? Yeah. So it may be, it won't be in a skill that you're needing right now, but it's one that's it's it's it will be beneficial for you later if you end up on a piece of land or with a small homestead even that you yeah. know with a little bit of land or whatever. Um, I just find it useful. So I think it's one that's it's fun too. You can just build some fun things. You can might even just make some gifts for people, you know, if nothing else, and just for practice. And it's a lot of I fun. I just thought of this when you were saying that is I checked out a book which I haven't picked up yet. We have like this way you can reserve the library online. Um, on whittling wooden spoons. There you go. And yeah. that's something you could totally do in an apartment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so. make it, yeah, make a useful item that you can use. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Or gifts or whatever, or useful items. And then, you know, our next subject was making household and personal products. This is yeah. something I do a lot of. And it, it kind of, to me, this one fits with foraging. It fits, it can yeah, fit with can. herbalism. Yeah. But it doesn't have to. It can just be, it doesn't have to be medicinal yeah. or in any form or anything like that. It can just be soap, yeah. <laughs> a clean household cleaners, you know. Um, you can't get into like lotions and salves just for your skin or whatever to just, you know, keep your skin from being dry. I think the first thing, one of the first things we ever made was homemade laundry detergent. Did you ever get into making that? I did, and then I stopped doing it. We anything. did, too, because we heard a lot of people say it could damage your washing machine and stuff. But there's some people that swear right. it doesn't, uh, you know, but I we did stop. My wife actually didn't like it. I, I actually didn't care. She actually didn't like it. Didn't, she didn't think the, what we were, the ones we were making were getting as clean as 
commercial soaps, but that's fine. And then if that's true, that's, that's, yeah, but but you get something that did get me kind of started in making household uh, personal products and things like that. So now my, one of my daughters is really into making soap. So she really loves doing that. And, and, um, she doesn't even I do it so. like you make it like the the really like traditional way. She does it more with the like the milk soaps the and melt and pour, yeah. Uh, yeah, the melt and pour things, you know, the kits and things. And she enjoys that. It's fun for her. But, right. but we use fun. them. The glycerin soaps are really <laughs> glycerin fun. soaps. Yeah, that's what they are. Yeah, but yeah, I make a, soap but too. Again, and I, I put a couple of links in the the two recipes that got me started in use making soap. I put in the links. One of them was um, Mother Earth Moose had a article they wrote about just using lard to make soap just your traditional lard lye and water Mm -hmm. and um to be honest with you that is one of the best soaps lean you right up super easy (laughs) yeah super easy but you can also make like you know if if you don't want to use animal products there's so many products out there you can use coconut oil you can use yeah so many of those and um the nerdy farm wife is actually a link. I really like her website. She does a lot of stuff, but she does a lot of soap and she's actually mm-hmm. written books on soap. One of my favorite recipes there was a milk soap recipe. Yeah. And um, she's just got a great website, but you know, with soap, you can, the sky's the limit. I mean, you can do the glycerin soap. You can do it with vegetarian or vegan options. Mm-hmm. You can do it with, you know, like I do the traditional homestead soap with, animal fats yeah um yeah and there's a lot of like things you can make like cleaners that a lot of it uses like vinegar and a lot of i mean there's just all kinds of different mixtures of things you can use to make different kinds of window cleaners and cleaners for cabinet tops i mean and and there's just there's tons of stuff out there you can just look for you know homemade whatever cleaner you're trying to replace and you'll find a recipe for it out there and then you can determine if it works as good or not i'd say some of them work sometimes better than store bought stuff. I don't know why, but why they would go overcomplicate it. But some things actually, I mean, work just as good or better than a, something you're going to go buy in a store. And and you made it for pennies, you know. And yeah. I would say learn those things again. No land needed. You can do this right in your apartment. Probably save yourself a few bucks and learn some skills well, of and, making and some with things. These things, I mean, the the environmental impact and your health impact with some yes. of these chemicals. Good point. Just yeah. Beyond. Yep, yep. I, I don't even know why some of the stuff that they put out there isn't a crime. It, even things like sh- oh. soaps and shampoos and things have so many oh, chemicals yeah. in them. Yeah. If you're making yeah. your own stuff and you know what's in it, oh, so much better for you. Well, and for me being blue, Skin's a large organ. <laughs> it absorbs a lot be, of stuff. You would be surprised how many allergens they put in that stuff. Yeah. Um, for me being yeah. gluten-free... They actually put wheat germ in a lot of things. Really? Yeah. See, yeah. that's crazy. This yeah. it just doesn't even seem necessary. It's probably more for the bonding purposes. I guess. I probably. Guess. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. But you know, you just it's again, you know what's in it. Yeah. It's mostly safe. Obviously, when you make soap the way I do, you're using lye, but you know, it's mostly safe. With the cleaners, you cleaning cleaners, you can even make your own vinegar with mm-hmm. scraps and yeah. You just, you know, what's in it and it's safe and you don't have to worry about the chemicals and. Absolutely a skill this year, maybe focus on, you know, if it's something you've never done before, I think it's a, I think it's a good one for sure. The next one's one that I've threatened to learn a few times, but I've not got around to it yet. And this might be the year where I say, I'm just going to sit down and I'm going to learn how to do, have some textile skills, you know, like sewing, knitting, crocheting, those kind of things. I'm always fascinated by what people can make with that kind of stuff, but I've. I've done basic sewing, you know, a little bit of sewing, but I'm not, I've never done, you know, with a yeah. sewing machine or anything much. I'd like to, though. I think it is kind of neat, you know, it what is, you can it do, is. what I, you can do with it. I have basic skills, which I taught my daughter. And then she's taken that and surpassed me and mm-hmm. ran with it. And she's like way better. Like I can hem a pair of pants and I can make really simple things. Yeah. But I can sew a button just, on. That's about my experience. <laughs> she has gone beyond and, um, she has got this in her mind to do crochet and kind of similar with me. I know how to knit, sew, and crochet, but I know the very basics. I'm not mm-hmm. exceptional at it. And um, I mean, I'm sure there's people in our group in the Homestead Front Porch. I have friends that knit these beautiful cable knit sweaters. Yeah. And, I mean, you can go crazy with it and turn yeah. it into, turn your hobby into a Homestead 
financial gain or <clears throat> teach classes. Mm -hmm. I have a friend that actually makes knitting patterns and sells her patterns, you know, just. Am, am I you know, like me nor my wife are really into this too much. We've not, we're not, we'd have never done it, you know, much, but one of my daughters actually, she taught herself how to crochet watching YouTube and she yeah. got, she's actually pretty good at it. I mean, she makes a lot crazy, of things huh? yeah. and she has a lot of fun, but you can learn it like that, or you can maybe just get with somebody who does it and have them show you the ropes, but you can absolutely do it from a video and learn how to do it. Just pay attention and do it. And then lots of practice. You'll, you'll start out really slow and it won't be pretty and you'll get quicker and quicker and quicker at it. And I mean, I witnessed it with my daughter and she just yeah. got really good at it. It's just a nice way to pass the time. You know, when my kids were younger and I would sit through lessons and stuff like that, mm -hmm. whatever they were, usually music lessons, because my kids played a lot of music. I'd sit there with my needles and make washcloths. Like I said, I was and, never really that good, but I would make washcloths and I would follow a pattern book. And that was how I learned how to do different stitches was just yeah. through a simple washcloth. Yeah. And, but, and you know what? For the wintertime, it's a great activity that you can be productive, but yet not have to be out in the cold. You can sit, in the, right. sit by a fire or whatever in the house or just sit there and watch YouTube videos or something while you're doing it or whatever and learn other things while you're making something. I mean, it's just... You know, I, I see that as a skill that's really valuable. And it's something I would like to, you know, I, I've talked about it many times. I mean, I guess a lot of guys don't really talk about doing it too much, but I think it's fascinating. I think it'd be fun to yeah. learn how to do more of it. I mean, I know some very basic things on the sewing, you know, but uh, knitting, my crocheting. Might, yeah. My husband might be upset for revealing this, but he's the one that grows flowers in our house. And mm -hmm. he's also the one that has been known to sit at the sewing machine. Well, I know a lot of guys who do like vehicle up upholstery and things and they're yeah, really good with sewing machines boat. and stuff like that yep. and that's so if it makes you feel more manly guys i mean just say you're learning it so you can fix up your hot rod and you know doing make some upholstery and and if you happen to you know make some clothing on the side no one's gonna judge you i mean it's all good yeah yeah he fixed his boat cover <laughs> yeah there you go Thank see you. it's a very useful yeah. and that's when, when i originally thought about learning it it was maybe to do upholstery and things for vehicles and things because i was you know at one point in my life a young man you know i was really into cars and hot rods and things like right. that and i was thinking man i'd love to be able to do some upholstery work you know and um yeah it's just a skill that's required for that i mean but then you can definitely transfer that into homestead activities yeah. as well for sure so yeah one of my favorite coaches in high school was is an award-winning uh, quilt maker. <laughs> he makes yeah, the, uh, those quilts, cool. those crazy quilts that are like art quilts. That oh, are like they're painting. amazing. Yeah. He makes those. I mean, thousands of hours people put into those. Yeah. Go to like the county fairs and stuff and they'll have like the oh, contest yeah. stuff where they're hanging up and stuff. And you look at some of those and it's like, wow, the hours put into those. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. And speaking of, I mean, I know not everybody likes this, but if you did like this and you were felt like you were missing community, like in the, um, especially in the winter time, you know, these old fashioned quilting bees where you sit around and people actually quilt oh, together yeah. and it's just kind of cool. We have I think a it local, is. Yeah. we have a local, um, sewing guild where the people actually sew clothing out of like old sheets and old pillowcases mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And then they send it to third world countries. Yeah. That's you know, neat. Just cool stuff. You know, there's just. The sky's yeah, yeah. the limit with this stuff, and you don't necessarily have to have acreage or even property to yeah. start learning all of these things and, Absolutely. and participate. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully that'll get some folks started. We do have some links in the show notes uh, yeah. that we mentioned, and there's uh, – see, so you added ones for soap. I've got the YouTube channel. Um, I, some links to some podcasts that I've done on some of these things are in the show notes as well. Um yeah. Some books that I thought we'd mention. Uh, when I was thinking about pressure canning and learning canning, uh, Angie Schneider's book, Pressure Canning for Beginners and Beyond, came to my mind. That's a really good book on just getting started with canning. If, if books are the way you like to learn yeah. things, that's a great book. Um, uh, I think as far as just ideas for learning skills, The Complete Book of Self-Sufficiency by John Seymour. We've mentioned that book so many yeah. times. But yeah. if you just want ideas on things you'd like to learn a skill on, that book's full of ideas. It's, it's just filled mm -hmm. with things that you can learn, you know, and you can take any of them as far as you want to take them, but it's just a great book for ideas, if nothing else. So I like that one. Um, now, this book I'm mentioning here for the modern herbal, uh, that one right there, I've heard a lot about. I don't own it. Have, do you own that book? I 
Let me click on it. I don't believe I do. I okay. I, somebody, I've had it mentioned books. to me a couple times from somebody, and I don't remember who it was. I couldn't remember if it was you or, but that's one I'm going to get, I think. Um, but that is one that. No, I actually, I think I have checked this one out from the library. Okay. I heard a lot about this book and I go check it out in the show notes, folks. It's one on, on herbal medicine making. Uh, I think that would be a good book for you. I don't own it, so I can't officially recommend right. it, but I've heard that it's one of the better ones on that. Uh, as mm -hmm. far as a book goes to, to give you information on making uh, herbal medicines. Uh, so check that one out. Um, you put a couple in here for fermented vegetables and butchering. Yes, uh, I own the food. I own all three of those. Uh, food drying with an attitude. Okay. I like that one because it has some different recipes in it for mm -hmm. um, dehydrating different things, not just your normal, your normal food. And then fermented vegetables. I just, I just love that book. I checked it out so many times in the library. I finally bought it for myself. <laughs> um, it's got. It's mostly, it's vegetables, mostly vegetables and mm -hmm. um, just some great recipes in there. And then the butchering book, I really like that book. It, um, the pictures in it are great. It tells you, like it shows you how to break down a bird, which I think yeah. is a really good skill for sure. saving money for the longest time. Now, I don't know. I haven't bought meat from the store for a long time, but for the longest time, you could buy a whole bird far cheaper than you could buy the cuts. Yeah. And so you learn how to do something like that. You have, you know, you save yourself money and then you have all of those bones for broth and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So yeah, I really, sure. really liked that book. And um, yeah, well, I was going to mention when you oh. talk about the links, almost yeah. all of your extension, when I say extension, I mean like your, um, your state college that has the what do you call it like their the farm county co-op extensions farm. yeah those yeah. are called your extensions so when we say extensions mm -hmm. that's what we mean so here in michigan it's msu msu has the extension yeah they offer t they offer classes on food preserving sometimes they offer them free and sometimes they're like five dollars and they're literally yeah. zoom classes where you actually can talk to people and get your questions answered i mean mm -hmm. it's just if you if you're nervous about learning how to say pressure can, that's just a great place to start for really yeah, affordable. For sure. Well, if you need some some items, some products to actually get started on some of these things, some of the things I would recommend is get a water bath canner. I put a link in the show notes for a stainless steel. You can buy a few different kinds. I like the stainless steel because it cleans better. It doesn't rust. It's just you know it's it's they're useful if you want to use them for other things. The pot for water bath canning. Um, so there's a link to that. Uh, you can get really elaborate with a pressure canner yeah. or you can buy a cheaper one, a Presto, a large Presto pressure canner will serve you well. Uh, the top of the line or the, you know, the all Americans, but they're, they're salty in price, but they are the best. I mean, they'll, it's something you'll probably hand down to your grandkids, <laughs> you know, but yeah. they're, they're pricey. Um, a Presto will be fine. You can actually get the electric pressure canner we was talking about earlier. I'll throw that link in here as well. It's the, the carry electric pressure canner. I like it. Some people say, oh, I don't like electric ones, but I like it. It's, it's convenient. Um, I put a link in here to the, uh, the fermenting crock that I just got for Christmas. Uh, my kids got me, uh, I like it. it it's just, I don't know. It, it it felt good in my hands. I had it on the table. I was like, oh, it's yeah. It's just a thing of beauty. I, I can't wait. I think I might even get something going in that today. I'm just okay. anxious to get started with it. And then you put a link in here for a stainless funnel and strainer for yeah, herbs, it's, which is Yeah, helpful. I use it a ton when I make Yep. When I make tea, when I make tinctures, when I make, I mean, yeah. I use funnels. I probably use a funnel on a daily basis at my house. Yep. Yep. We you could probably to... do a whole podcast on the items in my kitchen. <laughs> Probably so. You're yeah. you have all the tools for sure. I have lots of hand tools. I'm not a big gadget girl when it yeah. comes to. No, that's fine. I think that's great. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, I think that's enough, and I think it's enough to get folks started. Um, you got 12, 12 months in this year. Uh, are you going to learn twelve skills, folks? I think it it's a good goal to have to try to pick up twelve. I mean, there's I could think. I mean, I've got these ones here pretty much. I wouldn't say I got any of them. Uh, I'm a professional in any of them, but I, I've right. definitely dabbled in all these quite a bit. And, um, you know, I think there's some new yeah. skills I would like to learn for this year that aren't on this list. And we can all do that. Wherever you're at in your homesteading journey, uh, find 12 skills and um, maybe try to learn one a month. And I think if you're a beginner homesteader, 
these are a good place to start. If some of these don't <laughs> tickle your fancy, there's plenty others out there that you can uh, maybe try to to learn. And um, we didn't even mention today, but I, I like these ones. I think these ones will serve you well uh, where you're at and in the future as you grow in your homesteading journey and maybe end up with a piece of land later or something like that. So, um, yeah, I hope you got something out of this. And uh, did you have anything else you wanted to add, Rachel? No, I think that's it. Well, folks, we're glad you joined us today. And until the next episode, happy homesteading. God bless. And grow where you're planted. Looking around, I find the sea. I think I need a change. The rat race, I want to flee. My world, I'll rearrange. I'm getting back to the roots of how it's meant to be. Growing gardens, picking fruit, racing livestock, living free. It's a modern homestead. We do here every day Snapping beans like Grandma did Sitting on her front porch Hunting and fishing like a kid Once you've done all of your chores It's a modern homestead Today